cloud. Okay, everyone, welcome. Um, uh, so happy to see all of your faces and names on my screen. Um, really excited to have you all here with us this evening. Um, I hope all of you are happy and healthy and in good spirits. You and all of your families are doing well during these highly unusual times. Um, this is our fourth uh, Zoom conversation, and uh, I hope to organize, of course, many more of these in the future. Post-COVID, hopefully as well, we'll continue this, uh, this process. Um, but uh, again, before we get started, for those of you that are just joining us, we are recording tonight's talk, and we do that uh, for um, sharing this information out afterwards and for the sake of those that can't be here virtually, physically with us uh, this evening. Um, in the spirit, uh, of course, of inclusiveness and as a reflection of the diversity of our community, you can feel free to rename yourselves by mousing over the upper right-hand corner of your video. Uh, feel free to uh, put up your preferred name and uh, gender pronouns if you uh, so feel no, inclined. No, um, no, no. Line it up. I'm gonna mute you, Barbara, just for a second. Great, thanks, Barbara. Um, but just uh, feel free to uh, edit your name and how uh, you'd like to be referred to um, yeah, by clicking on that upper right-hand corner of your screen or of your uh, broadcast video and just select rename uh, from the uh, options. Um, uh, and again, and of course, you're welcome to broadcast your video tonight or simply listen in, uh, but we're gonna keep everybody on mute until later on in the uh, conversation, please. Um, and again, we'll open up that conversation probably around 7.45 East Coast time uh, in New York. Um, my name is Matthew Delegate. I am an artist and uh, I run Minus Space with my uh, wife, who's also an artist, uh, Rosana Martinez. I am uh, really lucky to have been able to do this for the past 18 years. A lot of uh, you have um, crossed paths with us in lots of different ways over that time. And I'm just really delighted um, that we have such a robust and um, I don't know, sort of less just creative community uh, around us. Um, I wear a lot of different hats. I'm an artist, I run a, obviously run the gallery. I've done a lot of curating and a lot of writing and I'm teaching in a couple of graduate programs here in and around uh, New York City. So I'm really fortunate to be able to do all of that. Um, uh, for those of you that are new to the gallery, we were um, we founded it back in 2003 to give a platform to what we uh, termed reductive abstraction. This was at a period of time when there wasn't a lot of painting being shown in New York City, let alone abstraction, let alone color field or geometric or kind of conceptually based uh, work being shown. So we decided to uh, launch an initiative uh, that started out online. And it's interesting that we have come full circle to an online conversation 18 years later, uh, but we existed online for a number of years before we opened up the project space, which became a commercial gallery, I guess is what we're running at the moment, the best way to describe that. So Pinocchio in a way has become a real boy and we're really uh, happy to uh, do it. So of course, tonight's conversation is with uh, Robert Swain, uh, who is um, probably needs no introduction to all of you, uh, but it is on the occasion of his fourth solo exhibition uh, with us over the past decade plus. And uh, we're really excited to be presenting his new show, which our images are behind me. If you can see them, if my gigantic head isn't blocking the way, uh, the show is called, um, Immersive color, and um, we're showing three uh, very large, oversized uh, color field paintings that Bob produced during the past uh, 12 months. Um, I would, uh, of course, like to give uh, a special attention to uh, what I feel is like a really amazing gesture by Bob, um, in that he dedicated his new show to the memory of firefighter uh, Robert Disma McMahon from Ladder Company 20. Engine 13 in New York City, who was a former art student of Bob's uh, back in the day at uh, Hunter College. And um, Firefighter McMahon, uh, unfortunately, uh, perished in the September the 11th um, terror attacks and um, left behind a young family. And uh, we opened Bob's show on September the 11th and Bob being the incredibly sensitive guy that he has uh, offered and asked me to dedicate the show to uh, to his memory. So I just wanted to give, uh, again, some attention to Firefighter McMahon and his memory uh, on this occasion. Uh, now, I would officially, uh, of course, like to welcome Bob Swain. Bob, welcome. I'd like to say a few introduction, uh, introductory words about you. This is, um, of course, Bob has been at it for 60 plus years at this point. 
he's got a very distinguished um, resume, lots and lots of experience doing lots of different amazing things. Uh, but he is uh, by far one of the most uh, influential color painters of his generation. There's no doubt or arguing about that. He was born in Austin, Texas in 1940 and grew up in Arlington, Virginia, just outside of DC. Uh, during high school in the late 1950s, he spent summers in Guatemala and Nicaragua, Nicaragua excuse me, working on the Pan American Highway. That's a whole presentation unto itself, which we probably won't get into detail here. Uh, he attended the American University in DC, where he uh, later received a BA in fine art in uh, 1964. Uh, during his undergraduate studies, he spent two years in Madrid, Spain, studying at the University of Madrid. In, uh, after his uh, studies concluded in 1964, he moved to Prov uh, Provincetown, Massachusetts, where he worked as a studio assistant to the American modernist uh, cubist painter, uh, Carl Knaths. I don't know if any of you are familiar with his work. We're gonna show a little bit of that uh, later today. Uh, then a year later, in 1965, Bob moved to New York City where he permanently settled in the Tribeca neighborhood downtown. And Bob's on Leonard Street and has been there for a really long time. Uh, in 1966, Bob began his first color-based work, uh, followed a year later by his first work using uh, the grid. And again, of color and grid is uh, clearly, uh, of course, what's on view at our space. Uh, right now. He participated in his first group exhibition, Light and Line, which was organized by John Baldwin at the legendary Park Place Gallery in New York City in 1967. That same year, he met a uh, sculptor, artist, uh, educator, Tony Smith, uh, who became a close friend of his and mentor over many, many years. Um, and they, Bob, I will uh, mention, uh, worked as, as his studio assistant for quite a while, worked on um, the execution and kind of conceptualization of a lot of the sculpture that, that, that Tony Smith produced uh, during that time. And, um, in 1969, Bob began to develop his own color system, a project of which is um, open-ended and not uh, finished to this very day. Uh, now he's been showing his work for more than 50 years. Some of his uh, landmark exhibitions that his work is included in was Art of the Real, uh, curated by Eugene Goosen at MoMA in 1960, um, when was that, 1968? Uh, the exhibition traveled for the next two years to the Grand Palais in Paris, Kunsthaus Zurich, Tate in London. He was of course included in the uh, Structure of Color exhibition curated by Marcia Tucker at the Whitney in 1971, which surveyed a new color field painting. He uh, mounted his first solo show, uh, first museum solo show in 1974 at the Everson up in Syracuse. Um, his work was included in the MoMA traveling exhibition, Color as Language. Uh, in 1974, which toured all of South America, uh, most of the countries there. And of course, his work was included in the Corcoran Biennial in DC twice, both in 1969 and 1998. Uh, he was the subject of a major 45 year uh, survey retrospective curated by Gabriella Everts, who I know is here with us this evening at Hunter College Times Square Gallery. Uh, he also installed a big show at uh, the Santa Monica Museum called The Form of Color in 2014, um, which was curated by uh, Jeffrey uh, Uslip. His work uh, is included in more than 300 public and corporate and private collections around the country. He's done uh, major commissions for uh, folks like Johnson & Johnson, IBM, Tupperware, uh, the University of Buffalo, and uh, many others. He's received awards from the Guggenheim Foundation, uh, two awards from the National Endowments for the Arts, uh, grants from the New York State Council on the Arts, and of course, the City uh, University of New York. And in addition to that, um, if that wasn't enough, he taught at Hunter College in their Department of Art and Art History from 1968 to 2014 where he educated and mentored countless generations of artists uh, for which in 1998, he was awarded the Distinguished Teaching of Art Award from the College Art Association. And they give out one of those um, each year. So that's a major uh, accolade. Um, I will turn it now over to Bob Swain. A uh, round of applause for Bob. Bob, welcome, for, welcome to our talk this evening. So happy you were willing to do this online with us. And I will uh, turn the virtual mic over to you. Thank you all for being here. Well, after that introduction, I suggest we all go out for a drink. 
Um, drinking is encouraged here. Um, drinking feel is. free to have a cocktail. Um, I'm somewhat embarrassed because I'm looking at all these other artists I acknowledge and recognize, and I think their resumes probably are greater than mine. Res resumes to me don't really count. It's really the core of the work and, and what the work is about. And I think if Matthew would put up the first slide, what I decided to I'm not going to talk about my career, and I'm not going to talk technically about a lot of things. I'm going to sort of walk through what people always ask me, where did you get these ideas for, from, and where did you assimilate them into your sensibility? Um, I traveled all over Europe. I left college when I was a sophomore, and lived uh, in Spain for a couple of years, came back and had to get a way of getting back through college. So I got a job as a guard at the Phillips Collection, which is a beautiful museum just above DuPont Circle in Washington, DC. And it was started by a couple, um, the Phillips. It was the, originally the family house. And then they turned that into their private museum. Uh, I started as a guard there. I worked there. You had to go in every morning and early before the museum opened. You had to clean the museum. And the museum was known, if you give me the next slide, they're one of their quintessential paintings. And a very bad uh, photograph was Renoir's baiting, boating party. And people from all over would come and look at it. And this was the big draw for the museum. I personally like the painting simply because it has a certain vitality to it and sensation from the color. Um, it's well structured. Um, next slide. And the museum is full of, full of Cezannes and uh, Van Goghs. The Phillips themselves were an elderly couple who would come chauffeured into the museum when it was off hours and they would sit in front of their collection. This is typical in front of this Van Gogh, for example. And um, they would have these conversations and I as a guard would have to stand a little bit behind them and listen to their conversation. If they needed anything, I would have to run around and help them. So on one occasion, they were talking about Van Gogh and um, his wife um, casually said, isn't it a tragedy that he killed himself? And Duncan, who was an early art critic and a very frank per person speaking, looked at his wife and said, he had syphilis. And with that, Marjorie, his wife, stormed out of the museum yelling as she went back to the chauffeured car. But there are many stories that I have because I spent two years, can I have the next slide, uh, there. And there are many strange things that happen when you're a guard. I had to follow these big tours around that would come in and people would give lectures about it. And one group came in went around this Matisse and the woman announced that Matisse was one of the greatest cubists that had ever lived. And I was astonished, but that was typical of what went on some next slide, please. And they had a room there full of Paul Clays, which were outrageous. They were beautiful paintings and quite funny. Some people would walk into it and you would stand there and you had to watch them, be sure they didn't touch the paintings. Some people would get the idea that Clay had an outrageous sense of humor. And this is one painting that I think is a good example of that. The reaction from the viewers was my own education of understanding how people looked at art and what they felt about it. Next slide, please. They had a Rothko room, which was installed in the early 60s. It was quite a remarkable room. Um, because I had to come early in the morning, clean the galleries. Often I would finish early and sit there and simply in the Rothko room. It's absolutely amazing. 
to assimilate this color over time by just simply sitting there. One of the reactions uh, I witnessed, which I thought was devastating, was a mother and her young daughter, about 11 or 12 years old, sat here for a while. I had to stand outside the room, be sure they didn't touch it. And the mother would ask the daughter, every time they looked at a work of art, what she felt about it. And as they walked out, the mother turned to the daughter and said, well, how did you feel about this? And the daughter said, I think I saw God. And the mother turned to the daughter and said, don't ever say that again. And they went and stormed out in the museum. Can I have the next slide? I'm very involved with this painting. There are a lot of paintings uh, that are sensational in the collection. This is an unfinished landscape by Cezanne. And I spent a lot of time looking at it. The little brush strokes were very important to me. I was trained from a very early age as a figurative painter painted from still lives, from figures, learned anatomy. But what struck me about this is that he was actually building with color and color sensation to put together a composition. Next slide, please. And you can look down at the bottom of this and you can see how he's slowly building the entire landscape. I was at American University painting from the figure, and I critiqued my own self because I wasn't building the anatomy with brush strokers, brush strokes, excuse me. I was simply filling in areas of space. And consequently, I was missing the sensibility of how the artist actually built the compositional structure instead of just filling it in. Can I have the next slide? This is a overall shot of it. Next slide. I graduated from college in 64, immediately left Washington. Washington is a very strange place. It doesn't really have a strong art community. And I went and I became an artist assistant to Carl Knotts, who is an American cubist. And this is a photograph uh, of Carl in his studio in Provincetown in the second story of the house he, he built with his wife. And Carl would mix oil paint and keep the oil paint in these little shells. Carl also was a uh, first generation German. He spoke German. I would wash his brushes every day, sometimes a dozen or two dozen. And then we would sit in his studio and he was reading a lot of the works by the Bauhaus in German. And I was reading it in English. And the difference between what he was translating and what I was reading in English was quite different. I mean, it was quite remarkably different. But I learned a great deal from sitting with him these afternoons, reading this. And also, give me the next slide. All of a sudden, that's a typical Carl Knotts painting. Next slide. He used an Oswell color system. I had gone through college, never been introduced to color. Nobody ever talked about it. Everybody said color was something you mixed up on your palette and you matched it to the object. And if it matched, you used it. It was observational color. I was stunned to see this and see that Carl used this. Next slide. And I think everyone in the audience knows what a color solid is. What was remarkable about it, give me the next slide, is that Carl actually was very involved with music in the diatonic scale. His color was integrated into the diatonic scale, the scale of seven, which classical music is involved in. And he would build paintings with the same idea of modulating through different hues and values. And then 
culminating it with some type of counterpoint. Uh, I was shocked one day because I went up to his house to wash his brushes. And I looked through the window and he was putting a painting on the piano. His wife was a very accomplished pianist and he was gonna play the piano based on the colors in the painting. In other words, the notes related to A was one note, so forth. And I watched him with his finger think these colors out. I never told him I watched him, but I thought that was absolutely fascinating. But the two things I went away from that was the fact that he had a kind of systematic way of organizing color around the Oswald color solid and a way of dealing with it and planning out what he was actually going to do with it. Next slide. I later was absolutely shocked to read about Sir Isaac Newton's theories and ideas and how Newton had taken the spectrum. Bennett, next slide. This is the visible spectrum. And next slide. Next slide. And Newton started this whole thing about the spectrum was a circular format, which it actually isn't, it's very linear. And he also assigned musical notes and used the diatonic scale in his idea of putting the universe together, relating not only planets, but everything else also to music and also to color. Next slide. What fascinated me about Sir Isaac Newton's discovery is that the diet, the scale, the electromagnetic scale is actually wavelengths of energy. And what I saw in the Renoir boating party was it has a kind of presence that comes out of color that normally you wouldn't get if a painting was only done with value. But here is evidence that color actually, next slide, enters the eye, goes through the retina, down the optic nerve and into your brain. And all of these rods and cones, all of this activity stimulates your whole physiology, the entire physiology of a human. Next slide. I became sort of excited when I read this report, and I don't know even today whether it's true, but theoretically you can see anywhere from 100,000 to 10 million colors. Um, I tried to count that once, I didn't get up to 100,000, but I started to think about the scope of what humans have and their ability to see all of these colors. Next slide. This is a very early painting I did in Provincetown, thinking about color. This was really the first really time that I focused on trying to get away from figurative work and also from using dominant shapes. And next slide. I started to work on abstraction. That abstraction came a great deal out of the Bauhaus work that I had read with Kanats. Next slide. And my attempt to try to use color as a vehicle in the painting and move away from using shape. Next slide. I had been working with spoons and jars. My wife would do some cooking and I would ask her to rinse out the jars and I would fill that up with paint. I'd make little paint samples. There was a famous uh, art guy who sold materials, David Davis, and I would go up and talk to David. He would let me open up oil paint and take these little samples home to look at and sort of get accustomed. I kept trying to understand how I could put together some kind of color system. Next slide. Some kind of thing like Moncel, where I would have all the different 
extremes of color together, next slide, in a color solid. So oddly enough, I saw, thought as soon as I got enough money, I would build my own color system. Next slide. This was a major undertaking on my part. Uh, it took me two or three years just to get it underway. And what I actually did is I built based on an armature similar to Munsell, a color system where I took individual pieces of color, painted them, organized them in charts and also next slide. And this is a chart, this would be a chip. And I, it took me years of doing this, of putting this together so I could systematically deal with color. Um, I took this information when computers came of age and I scanned each one of these squares or about 4,000 of them and I put them into a computer. Next slide. So typically, this is the paint. These are the charts I work with. And I have colors, chips, as well as jars of color. Next slide. That have the exact color in my system. I keep it organized simply so I can put it together, next slide, in charts. So like Chopin or Beethoven organizes his music, I organize my work according to color relationships. So I know what these two are, those two are, I know what the contrast is, I know how to modulate across the surface, I know all of the extremes and things that I want to put into a particular composition. So the paintings behind Matthew represent on the lower left-hand corner, light hues modulating up towards dark and also hues going the other way towards their opposites. Next slide, please. Typically, this is a jar of paint. I would be mixing up plastic spoon. This has the hue, value, and saturation on it. And it also has an indication of what painting I'm trying to work on. Next slide. So basically, those are the charts, the beginning of paintings I would be doing. And these are the layout of the jars. At one point, I got frustrated using the jars that my wife would give me from the kitchen, and I called up a jar company in Brooklyn and asked them how much 200 jars were. And the guy said, we don't sell 200. Our minimum is 2,000. And I said, OK, sarcastically, how much is 2,000? And they gave me the price, and I thought, that's astonishing, and I bought them. So every couple of years, I buy 2,000 jars and tops. They're very reasonable. Next slide, please. These are the spoons I use. Uh, they're not marked with the hue, the, hue, the value, and just throw them away. But maybe I use a couple of thousands of these uh, just to mix up a painting. Next slide. Studio shot. Up there is a my color system up there. These are the cans. I have a paint mixer. I start out with large quantities. I can only get about 15 hues plus white and black. Uh, that's me in the background staring out. Next slide. Another shot of the studio. I have a couple of floors. So on one floor, I mix paint. Next slide. On another floor, this is where I actually paint the larger painting. I built this scaffolding that rolls up and down. And I'm up there painting away. I dry the paint acrylic with fans. Initially, I only liked oil paint. It has better colors, um, but I can't deal with the toxicity of them. Next slide. Typically, that's the artist painting with his paintbrush. Originally, I sprayed all of these squares with a spray gun. Then I found it much easier and better to just simply use a paintbrush and paint. Next slide. 
use tape to square it off. Next slide. I want to run through just a couple of things from the beginning. Next slide. This is the very early painting in 68. These are individual squares screwed together. Next slide. These also are individual triangles screwed together. I changed the configuration I was working with to try to get more content out of the color. Next slide. I did some rather large round paintings that were spectral. Actually, that's my color system on the right. Next slide. That's the young artist himself. Next slide. I got feeling that all these shapes detracted the idea, moved away from the idea of dealing purely with color. This is a painting I did for the Corcoran in Washington. These are individual squares screwed together in a panel. And I felt that I should be, find a format that allowed color to speak without being any kind of shape or anything else, strictly only the color. Next slide. So I started to move into just getting squares to speak and focus on color alone. So there was no distraction of getting into shape. Modulating in size, I felt was permissible. Modulating through all of the different types of relationships that color has. Next slide. This is a show I had in Santa Monica. The scale I felt was very important. This museum gave me the opportunity to have a seven foot, a 70 foot painting. The reason for that is that if you can actually see a hundred thousand colors, I was attempting to get these colors out. So you as the audience could actually experience the entire next slide, the entire range of possibilities that color represents. Next slide. This is one of the paintings that was in the show. Um, there's a little story that I was told that the director of the museum said that this European critic was going to come and critique me because he didn't believe in modern painting. And I thought, well, I'll take whatever criticism he has. He came in, he looked at the work. He said, oh my God, this is a lot about color. I said, yes. And kids came in were allowed to come into the opening and immediately started dancing. There's so much energy that comes out of color and people perceive it if they give a moment or two to actually allow you, like with the Rothko's, to receive this energy level. Next slide. It was a great space to have a show. The museum has been rebuilt in another location. Next slide. Next slide. Same slide again, next slide. These are brushstroke paintings where, I think this goes back to the Cezanne where I'm using individual brushstrokes and their relationships to create color sensation. Next slide. Sorry, the slides aren't better, next slide. Next. Next. This is an exhibition that uh, Gabriel Everts, a colleague of mine at Hunter College, organized. Incredible exhibition that she did. Next slide. I have this painting in my studio right now, if anybody wants to come and see it. Next slide. And this is Matthew's work. Next slide. I apologize for running through this so quickly and not in depth, 
but I wanted to give a little bit of the background that I came from. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, an amazing survey done very, very quickly. Um, I can see that we have a very large number of participants today. And in the interest of time, uh, I don't know how all of you are feeling, but there are a couple of questions that have already started coming in. And I'm wondering if maybe we should just go ahead and um, turn it over to audience questions. Um, maybe I'll start off with one, Bob, in that that photograph you showed us earlier, I'm just going to scroll back to it, um, where you showed us this image, a three-part image that was included in your retrospective at Hunter College. You clearly have a grid work on the right side. That's a work I know from the late 1970s. The brushstroke work you started when on the far left side? I've worked on that for a long time. I even have paintings that go back to, oh my God, to the 70s that I never finished developing. But I always was trying to get it working. One problem I had, like all artists had, is getting the materials. It takes a lot of materials to do a brushstroke painting or any of these paintings. So it's an economic problem. I would like to continue to pursue it today. And then that final work that's at the front center of this image is solely gray value, right? We're yeah. not seeing any, any specific color here. Um, no. Interesting. Yeah, I just wanted to point that out just so it was clear on your screen that this is a, a gray value painting. Um, yeah. So I'm um, going to encourage all of you to either raise your virtual hand if you've got questions or thoughts or wisdom to share here. Uh, you can do so by uh, scrolling over the bottom of your screen and uh, either raising your hand virtually under, um, well, let me see here, where, where is that exactly, under reactions. Or if you would like to uh, type a question uh, into the chat field, I'm keeping an eye out for uh, that as well. And um, there's a question already that's come in from uh, Horacio saying, how long did it take you to make um, your personal favorite artwork, Bob. So how long does it take you to uh, make a painting in general? So say the work that you have on view in our show, you've got a couple of nine by nine footers and a 10 by 12. Um, how does that generally, um, what does that process generally look like from conception to execution? Normally it takes anywhere from a year. Sometimes it comes much faster. I can do something. I have a couple of people that help me. Sometimes I can get something together in two or three months. It also depends on the problems of getting the proper structure together. You can get a painting like the one in back of you, 10 feet by 12 feet. You can get it to work, but there'll be one or two squares that won't cooperate. And, um, then it becomes very problematic to resolve it. But the answer to the question is, I don't know. I never paid much attention to that. I just work until I try to finish. Got it. So the, the, the time that it takes to, uh, to get there. Yeah. Michael Brennan, you've got your hand raised. Go ahead and unmute yourself, please. That was, that was really excellent. Um, I was just curious, Bob, when you, um, when you went over the uh, paintings that were composed of the train. Speak louder, Michael. When you, uh, when you went over the paintings that had the triangular configuration, yeah. you said you were trying to get more content out of the color. Are you talking yeah. about anything besides shape there? Well, the triangular shape is interesting because at the lower, where the triangles come together at the tip, you get a different color sensation when it's next to or adjacent to the other triangles. The larger part of the triangle as it expands, you get the color, which relates also to I spent months trying to figure out the right square. Should the square size be 13 inches, should it be nine inches, how big should the square be? My wife for a while thought I was nuts because I would cut out squares and put them up and try to decide because if I had a grid, let's say of 
four squares and I put them together. They optically mix on each edge. If they're too small, they leave the middle out. If they're too big, it's all about the middle. So the triangles were the same thing. It's trying to get the shape that you put them in to have multiple readings. At the tip of the triangle is one optical mixture or optical contrast, depending. Thank you for that question, Michael. Um, a question coming in uh, from one uh, member of our audience uh, would like to hear more about the brush stroke paintings. Again, this is uh, something, at least in, in terms of our working together, Bob, we've only shown a couple of them over the years in various projects. Um, but I feel like there's a, a whole body of work here that um, hasn't received much attention since your uh, retrospective. So can you talk a little bit more about the brush stroke paintings? Sure, I mean, basically being trained as a figurative painter, I relate to brushes, I always have. Building space, the Cezanne example, really had a great influence on me. I like the idea that the individual brush stroke is from my sensibility put on the canvas and that I choose a color and put it together in relationship with others and it builds a structure in and of itself. There are no shapes involved. And I think one of the critical thing is, I was trying to move away from shapes. That's why I stopped doing circles and triangles and hexagon. I was trying to say the color has a unique function. I never met a color I didn't love. I always look carefully at a color and wait until its sensibility surfaces its radiant energy comes to me and allows me to experience it. And the brushstroke paintings, I'd like to continue. It's, uh, I have plans for them. It's simply getting enough time to do them. Great, thank, thank you for that, Bob. I saw Barbara Stanchek had a hand raise at one point. Yes, Barbara, is that right? We'll wait for Barbara to unmute. We hey, should Barbara. just, there we go. Hi Bob, uh, great lecture, but I wonder compared to Julian's work, do you envision in its totality, the psychological impact of each painting? Before you start, do you have it in your mind? In your mind's eye? I have a general idea Mm -hmm. as one would construct Beethoven's pieces or how, how you would do. But the problem, and I'm sure your husband had the same problem, you never know exactly how the color is going to act until you put it in a compositional structure and look at it. <laughs> I dream of having a pure hue that's saturated, that's yellow, that's dark. They don't make it. I have thought I would build a painting and I would end up with a dark yellow. No, you can't. So you have to be very conscious. And I, I adore your husband's work and I've followed it. And I think that he knows a vocabulary in what each color can do. The question is, is when you put them together in a relationship, you know? You know, <laughs> okay, thank you. We should look at his work instead of mine. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for that question, Barbara and Bob. Um, question came in from Linda, who was curious about your process and decision making during the painting process itself. Do you find yourself changing and tweaking the overall design? I guess, Linda, to read into your question while you're making the work, um, responding to what you're seeing, Bob. What does that look like? Decision making. Well, it's strange. I think every artist has a way of approaching painting. Um, I do preliminary studies. In other words, I do small examples of what the painting might be. I make corrections. If it's a difficult painting, I might do 10 preliminary studies, 10 stretch canvases that are small and try to understand what the problems are. 
So when I get to the last painting, like the paintings behind you, I pretty well have ironed out the problems. But my logic, the way that I do things, is akin to an architect's logic about drawing a plan, orchestrating what materials will be used, getting models, I do models, and then finally building the last thing. The one thing I liked about working with Tony Smith is that we were similar in that we would plan, sketch, build models, and then build the final piece. But that's my logic. I do not work spontaneously. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you for that. Uh, another question that came in, uh, particularly regarding mixing paint. Uh, how are you measuring the paint? How are you measuring the mixtures? Is it by weight or by scale or by eye? I don't believe it came up earlier in your presentation, Bob. There no. is a color spectrometer involved in this process. It's in your studio. I've seen it. Photo spectrometer, excuse me. Uh, how do you actually make the paint, Bob? Initially, it was all done by eye. Um, I found out that I could use a photo spectrometer to match my color system. And when you mix up a quart or a gallon of paint, I used to do it by manually, by hand and eye, and I would lose paint because I couldn't get the exact match. The photospectometer is an instrument that measures the wavelength of an individual color and allows me to match it to my color system. After that, it goes into a jar. Then subjectively, it's mixed again by looking at a sample and adjusting it. So it's not a mechanical thing. I'm not going from a color chart to the painting. I'm going from the color chart to a jar and then mixing it by looking at it and carefully adjusting it. This should be a little lighter, this should be a little darker. But the con computer also has allowed me to do, take my color system, put it in the computer with Photoshop, do a painting, look at it, and say, God, I hate this, get rid of it. And I just saved $500 worth of paint. In the past, I would actually paint the thing, look at it, I wouldn't paint it, I thought it would be awful. So it's a shortcut to getting to the content. And to continue that line of thought, Bob, you often use the uh, computer so to, to kind of come up with those initial so sort of design considerations and you often print those out onto paper and have them pinned around your studios like we saw in, um, in some of the images you showed us. So they end up on paper first in a way. Yeah, all the time. Mm -hmm. Great, so there's a couple of questions that came in from Andrew who asked if you ever work with transparent pigments or do you prefer to keep the paint as opaque as possible? We'll start with that one. Well, I would like to work with transparent pigments, but I've never got that far. I, I, I stick with the OP paint. It's a very nice question though. And are you ever uh, using a colored ground to paint on instead of a white one? No, I usually use uh, colored with its textured a little bit because it bounces the light around better. Terrific. Uh, there is a question asking about who makes the best spectrometers. Looking for a sponsorship opportunity here, clearly. Um, thoughts, Bob? What brand do you use and when did you get it? This was a long time ago you've had that, since the 1980s, if I'm, if I'm I correct. Would like the, the leading one in the field is x right. I would like to buy one there about eight to ten thousand dollars and i'm sure <clears throat> if somebody wants to donate eight or ten thousand dollars i'll run out and buy one no the one i use is really old i have a very old uh, computer i use also um but all these years it's held up great and uh one more technical question coming in from andrew gonzalez about um, how is the paint mixed from the spectrometer information so you've got, a, you've got a read on the spectrometer and how does that work? Well, first of all, when I initially built my color system, I did it by hand and spoons. So I have a notebook about this thick that has a recipe for each color in that system, 4,000 colors. It took me years to do it. So I open it up and I 
if I want to mix up a light blue, I first I look in the book and it says use phthalo blue. That's the pigment. Then it says use 24 spoonfuls of titanium white. So I put that in and mix it up. So I'm close, but not real close. So then I take a piece of slip of cardboard. I take out a sample. I dry it. Then I measured on the photospectometer to see if it matches my color system. Then I make adjustments. So I'm halfway there. Then that quantity is mixed up and distributed to jars that are later adjusted. But it's a step-by-step -step process. And Bob, I know you've expressed just as a follow-up uh, question about conversations we've had. You've had um, you've expressed some frustration over the years about simply the basic materials that you're using to start that recipe process. That you mentioned, phthalo blue is not phthalo blue consistently throughout, right? Yeah, I've had some long-term relationships with different manufacturers, Golden and Liquitex. Liquitex goes out on the market, world market, and buys. Um, pigment. They don't care whether they buy an orange with a little red or a little yellow. They get their pigment. People aren't that particular about it. I got into a long relationship with a Liquitex um, chemist who was very nice to me, and he would warn me in advance if they got a batch of pigment that was not spectrally abs absolutely where it is. Now, all of that's been cleaned up recently. You can go to Golden and they will tell you where the spectral curve is on a particular pig pigment. The real fallacy, the, the capitalists have gotten into this. So they make these colors called the hue of blue. So they take 51% pigment and then they take the rest 49% filler. So you get a pigment, uh, you get a jar of this paint, looks blue. Well, if you go cut it with a gray, it's gonna look like muddy blue. It doesn't have the ability to be broken down. I take a blue and break it down into 100 to 200 colors immediately. So it has to be a pure pigment, but there's a lot of problem in manufacturing pigments and being sure that their first thing we do is measure. Great, thank you for that. Uh, a question from Sharon Brandt, which I think is a really astute one, uh, regarding uh, the texture of the surfaces of your painting. So for those of you that haven't had the opportunity to see Bob's work in person and have only been uh, seeing what it looks like on our website or through uh, reproduction, it looks extremely flat and sort of pristine, but that's not the case of the actual surface of the work. So Bob, how do you get that surface? Um, what are you looking for in the surface? Uh, we've talked a lot about this over the years, but uh, tell us what you think. Well, first of all, the surfaces are primed about 10 to 12 to 15 times. And I want a, a slight stipple texture on the square because when it's painted, it refracts the light in different directions. It helps the color combine with the one next to it. If it was simply flat paint, it would do some of that, but it wouldn't have this way of kind of spreading its radiance out. So it's actually what I worked with for a long time to try to figure out how much texture to put on the canvas before I painted the final coat. Thank you for that question, Sharon. A uh, question from Bob Yeager asking, how does gray fit into your thinking and seeing? The color gray. Like all colors, it, it has its own aura, its own content, its own sensibility. Uh, gray is extremely important. When you talk about gray too, I mean, grays can be gray to the red, gray to the blue, it can be all, different types of grays. Um, I think the thing is that it's a major factor in desaturating <coughs> colors. When I painted figuratively, we were taught to mix a skin tone and take the complement and match it to the model. You would actually walk up to the model with your brush or whatever and see if it matched the skin tone. 
gray is the ability to change the saturation of a pure color and keep control of it very carefully. Uh, gray in itself is a color. And there's quite a bit of gray in the painting that is over my shoulder here, which I found um, yeah. unusual in recent work. There's a huge sort of gray stripe that runs through it from uh, upper right to bottom, uh, bottom left in that 10 by 12 foot painting uh, that's brand new. So gray is definitely still, still, still present in your, in your uh, thinking, Bob. A couple of other questions uh, from Ruth uh, Pastine, where to go? Um, question about your brushstroke paintings. Are they spontaneous in their execution? or not? Yes. I actually have my paintbrush and I'm before it and I'm painting away. But the palette you've selected is not spontaneous for those, right, Bob? Right. Okay. The, the thing about those brushstroke paintings is I'm trying to put together, for example, complementary colors, let's say a red and green. And I'm trying to use large and small brushstrokes. The smaller the brushstrokes are, the changes the whole appearance of the color and creates a completely different type of thing. Also, the painting in back of you is based on something. In Provincetown, when I lived there, down the street was Hans Hoffman. Mm -hmm. And I used to talk to him. And Hans Hoffman was famous for this one cliche, push-pull, push-pull, always push-pull. And I think that was his metaphor for tension. In these paintings, there is, excuse me, in these paintings, <laughs> typical, in these paintings, you will notice there are extremes. There's light and dark, there's difference in hues, there's different in hues, and there's difference from gray to pure. So there are the three dimensions of color being used, the three dimension of color being used, hue, value, and saturation, both as contrast and both as mixture. So you have hue, contrast, value, contrast, saturation, mix. And you get into the whole depth in the whole concept of what color is about, you know? And you're, you're resolving sort of three-dimensional color questions on a two-dimensional surface, which I think is particularly particularly tricky. Um, that sort of color solid idea that you were, you were discussing earlier, Bob. Yeah. Uh, a few more questions. I'm just keeping an eye on the time. We're just at about eight o'clock. I feel like we have a good conversation here going that I don't want to stop short. So I'm going to continue with the questions in the chat, if that's okay with you, Bob. Sure. Uh, a few more are waiting uh, for response. Um, question from Jody regarding working with the grid structure for such a long time. How do you keep each new work exciting. Uh, when you make it, do you base your self-criticism on the effect of the new color relationship that it generates in terms of light, the emotional content of the light, fast, slow, or something else altogether? So how do you keep it exciting? Or maybe how did you arrive at these works which you've never, never quite made before, Bob? I think what it is, is there are so many relationships that you can have with color. I mean, I, I dream about doing a painting that has predominantly 70 or 50 feet of just reds. I think that, that there is an endless amount of situations I could place color in to give the viewer the access to all of these dimensions that we're supposed to be able to perceive. Um, yeah, I've used it for a long time. It is the configuration I use. I also use the brush stroke. But also, I've made these paintings. I think if you go back to the paintings that have large squares and big squares, I don't know if you can switch back there. Let me, yeah, because there's a second question about those that, that Sean Powell also asked about speaking about those compositions and the use of different size squares. Let me see if I can pull one up, but continue uh, speaking, Bob. Yeah. Hold on, everybody. Let me just pull one of those works up here. Yeah. There we go. Sorry. My apologies, present. 
There we are. These paintings are about having a definite set of contrast and a definite set of modulations together in one holistic composition. So I'm trying to show that these two particular oppositional hues can exist together along with the modulation going from one extreme of light and dark to another. So I think there's more room there. I've been working on this series right now that I started a long time ago. Right. I don't know if that answers. You know, the problem with Sean is Sean is a pretty smart guy, and I'm not sure I answered his question. Great. Well, thank you for, for that. So there's a question from Anna asking about whether you can talk a bit about the differences in the notation between the Bauhaus in German and the Bauhaus in English. Any thoughts there? Well, I go back read, and, readings. I, I refer to one of my colleagues, Gamriel Everett, who is, uh, along with Sandy Wormfeld, one of the champions of color. And Gamriel speaks fluent German. And... Um, she and I would converse about this. And German is a more complicated language than English is. I think that German language has more descriptive ways of dealing with things. And listening to Gabriel talk and listening to Karl Knott's talk, they believe that it has more ability to convey the sense of something. I once looked up, I think, uh, what are there? There's 170 some odd thousand words that we can use. I don't think our language has as much descriptive ability as German. And I trust Gabriel's and Karl Knotz's um, assessment of this. Thank you for that. Uh, a question that came in, uh, an interesting one from Mel Prest, who's based on the West Coast, an artist. I imagine you choose a particular black for your gray rather than a chromatic black. Do you use Mars, carbon, ivory, or another one? Boy, this guy is really smart. Um, I have fought with this question for years. Sometime I'd like to meet him. Her, hey, uh, or she. Her. <laughs> yes, her. sorry. No, yeah, sorry about that. Um, we tried for years to use ivory, bone black, there, a whole series of blacks I've tried to use. Um, a gentleman who works with me, Yao Zulu, just did a whole series of tests with different blacks. And with his help, we're trying to evaluate which black to use. It's complicated also because the manufacturers put gloss in them. So we don't know exactly where we are, but hopefully sometime this month or next month, we'll be able to come up with that answer. And I apologize for not having a specific answer, only to say that we're trying to figure it out ourselves. If she finds it out, let me know. Thank you for that. And a follow-up question just quickly, Bob, in the paintings that you have uh, made today, you never use a uh, straight white or straight black. Is that true? No, that's not true. Not true? No. So the work that I have in the corner here above me, I think yeah. most uh, folks that have come into the gallery perceive that as being black or into black, but it's not black at all, is it? No, it's not. You have to be very careful about that because actually some of the thalo colors are darker than any black you can buy. And also most blacks, not I sh that's a bad statement to make, but some blacks have an attitude. They may be to the blue or they may have some type of hue content in them. Fantastic. Uh, a couple more questions um, and then we will wrap it up this evening. It's been a great conversation, everybody. There's a question uh, regarding um, when you are, let's see here. 
when you are conceiving a new painting and you're starting with the overall composition of it, um, to what extent does the composition develop over time while you are working on the preparatory paintings? This is a question from Lauren. Complicated question. I lay these things out with numbers. Each number has a relationship to other numbers. I try initially to solve the problem by using the colors that I developed in my system and looking at the colors. Each color has a label, hue, value, and saturation. If I place that next to another color that has hue, value, and, and saturation, I know that if the hues are different, like red and green, it's going to be a complement. If the values are different, one could be light and one could be dark or the saturations. So I try to solve some of the problems there, but painting the original study is very important because then I can really make an assessment of it. Great, thank you. And then we have uh, just uh, two more questions. Um, one coming from Pierre Obando, who you know, I was at your opening. I heard you make the di distinction between artists working towards extension or working towards closure. Uh, how does that thought relate to how you've worked over the years? Um, that is a very philosophical question from Pierre. I've always worked towards extension, not closure. And I'm not sure whether Pierre is referring to closure in the way of resolving a particular painting to a certain point. But I rather thought, I don't know, I'd have to talk to Pierre more about it. But that's a very interesting question. You know, very philosophical. Yeah. Pierre, would you like to jump in? I see you've unmuted. Yeah, I, I, more like what, what did you mean by closure? What would closure be? Closure would be like resolving something finitely, um, not allowing a person to participate beyond a certain extreme or level. So it would be involved with balance, something like that, or dynamic equilibrium where it's all played out. Extension would be like something where you set up a, a system of continuing modules where it goes for a long time. For example, the 70 foot painting that we worked on would be more like extending it instead of closure. It's hard to find the end of that. It's hard to find its final resolution. It's hard to determine the extent of it. It relates to like Brancusi's endless column. It just keeps going up. You know, it's not like a Donald Judd box or something. It's not closed. And you've, you've mentioned, Bob, uh, Gabriella Everts' work as well. And Gabriella, I know, suffers uh, from a similar issue when she's trying to finish a painting while painting it from left to right. How does one finish that work? Um, how does one bring closure to it? So it's an interesting, an interesting issue, certainly among color painters, uh, I'm sure among others as well. So um, a question from Jesse Stillwell. Um, are you working on any series uh, aside from the grid and brush work, brush stroke works? Uh, anything that you have in the works? Anything that you're thinking about? New formats? Probably not. I'm trying to develop these formats a little more. Great, terrific. And then uh, he had a follow-up question regarding when you are uh, developing a specific painting and you have certain squares that stand out that aren't quite uh, falling into line in terms of that modulation, like what do you do? How do you respond to that, Bob? I try to make an adjustment based on visual assessments, actually sitting there and looking at it, seeing, well, maybe I should put a little white in it, or maybe I should put a little value in it or something, you know? Terrific. And then one final question from Sean, which is regarding baseball. And are the Yankees going to make it to the playoffs, Bob? I know you're a big baseball fan. All right. This is, uh, this is confidential. Sean, as a young man, hit 600 and chose art over baseball, and he should have played for the Yankees, and they would have gone to the playoffs. But, oh, no, Sean had to be an artist, be a teacher, be a professor, and now we're not going to win the World Series. 
You see the implications of your teaching, Bob. This is, uh, we hold you responsible for this, I think, yeah. at this point. So at any rate, thank you all for a wonderful conversation this evening. I hope you found it illuminating and interesting. And I just want to uh, give a big thanks to Bob for spending time with us tonight in this sort of new format and new medium. This is unusual for all of us. So I felt like the conversation was great um, and I'm really happy we had it. And I'm particularly happy that we recorded it and that recording will be uh, posted on our YouTube channel as soon as it is fully rendered and it'll be up there for uh, in perpetuity. As long as there is a YouTube and an internet, um, it'll be up there. So I wanna thank all of you for joining us as well. Thank you for taking the time out of your schedules. I know how busy all of you are uh, wearing lots and lots and lots of hats. I just wanna say I'm grateful to you for joining us and uh, thank you all for your really interesting questions and insights and uh, just for making this a, a terrific event uh, all around. Now, Bob's uh, show is going to continue through November 20th. So there's plenty of time still to see it. Uh, it's a kind of a Herculean effort to pull these shows off, particularly these days when logistics have kind of gone out the window, everything that we originally uh, counted on uh, no longer applies. So uh, we have uh, three uh, very large format paintings on view uh, for your pleasure through the end of November. And um, if our regular hours don't work with your schedule, I'm often there in between times on Tuesdays and Fridays and other days as well. So just uh, shoot me uh, an email, drop me a line if you wanna spend some time there um, and see the show again. So uh, without further ado, thank you all for joining us. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, lots of luck to everybody and see you uh, hopefully at the gallery. Thanks so much. And again, thanks, Bob. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us and have a great night. Stay safe out there. And thanks, Bob. Thank really you. Terrific. Thank Talk you. So